Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and good morning. Again, we will be returning to our study in Zechariah 3. Again, we are going to be looking at this to see what rays of truth we can glean from this portion of Scripture and what there is for us to consider at this time for our characters, for the movement, for the message that needs yet to be given. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance as we open his word and we prepare to study together? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, We thank you for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to come together to study, to open your word, to learn of that which you are using to warn us, to edify us, to instruct us, to correct us. Please forgive our sins. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to join together, to come before you, to be guided in all things. May our minds be open today. May your angels attend us. May your spirit instruct us. Help me today, Father. Hide me behind your cross. Direct us so that that which we discuss may help us to be prepared to give a message that you would have us to give to this world. May we be able to do so simply and directly. Be with us now. We invite you, for there are more than two. And as you have said, where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We thank you for this promise. Help us now to listen and to learn of that that you would have us to understand. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to do a brief recap from what we were last discussing last week. As the pen of inspiration presented, Again and again, since 1845, the dangers of the people of God have been laid open before me, and I have been shown the perils that would thicken about the remnant in the last days of time. So, could we say here that again and again since 1845, 45 years earlier than this document was written, was were these perils were these dangers repeated over and over to mrs white and is this important for us today mm -hmm. these perils have been revealed to me down to the present time and on the night of november 3rd there was laid out before me some things which I could not comprehend, but the assurance was given me that the Lord would not allow his people to be enshrouded in the fogs of worldly skepticism and, and infidelity. But they would, if they would follow his voice, rendering obedience to his commandments, he would leave them above the mists of skepticism and unbelief and place their feet upon the solid rock 
where they might breathe the atmosphere of security and triumph. So here we have another set of if-then statements. If they would follow his voice. Then they might breathe the atmosphere of security and triumph. We have to choose this day whom we will serve. No soul is saved except as he is found standing on the elevated platform close beside our advocate and surety, where light shines from the throne of God, illuminating the pathway and preventing the wily foe from stealing the march upon the servants of Christ. This statement stands in opposition to those that believe that Christ is going to save all, even those that continue to sin and that have rejected the law and the testimonies. The only hope of a perishing world is found in the union that can be formed between humanity and divinity. Humanity is perfect only as it is united with divinity. And we discussed this a little bit last night in, in the study. Because mm -hmm. um, Christ was showing that, or Christ, uh, Jones was showing that Christ is us. Right. He's right. that we are in Christ. Christ is in us. And that and we talked a bit about the quote um, that human humanity and the divinity combined cannot commit sin. So so we discussed a little bit about the idea that uh, there is a statement in Youth Instructor. It talks about the uh, the corrupt channels of humanity or something like that, that right. are have to be purified by Christ. Christ has to take those and, and purify them. And that quote's been misused to um, uh, to say that, you know, that Christ basically covers all of our sins, that we don't actually become changed. And that we're saved character. in our sins. Yeah. And so it's, so we had compared with what Jones had talked about and what Ellen White had said there. And then we can understand the statement. And it's basically this idea that uh, we need Christ to be us so that he, we can be changed, right? It's not so that he just does it for us, but he does it in us, right? He lives his perfect life in us because he did it once already. So he can do it again. So anyway, that just... Okay reminded us of what we discussed yesterday so in this when this statement states presents to us that the only hope of the perishing world is found in the union that can be formed between humanity and divinity and it's not just the union that it was in christ back then right that he just did it then um but it's actually in the unity that must exist now. What's, what is another word for a union? Marriage. Correct. Covenant. Yes. Can we also see... Covenant. That a, can, can we also see that a union can also be equated with a league... Okay, yeah, an agreement. So, so here we have a, a situation. We, we have a, an example. God sought to be in union, in covenant with the children of Israel. But God also was very specific that you are not to form a league with the nations around you. Does that apply to us today? 
Yes, it does. Okay. This is something I think that we're going to need to put in the back of our minds as we are preparing for the camp meeting that is coming up. Our only hope is to be unified with God, to be unified with Christ. And and that, to me, simply means following the principles. I mean, it's not just that, but it includes following the principles and the character of Christ, so that every right. way we approach things is not as man would approach them, but as, as Christ would approach them. And he demonstrated how that is done. So it's trusting God's word above man's word. It's, um, you know, not seeking to figure out man's methods to try to convert as many people as you can, but following Christ's methods of how he reaches the heart. Because when man applies his methods, it can do an outward reformation, but right. not inward reformation. And that's really the main problem because Heidi and I have been reading five testimonies. And that's really the problem of Adventism back in the 1880s. But I think it's it's definitely true today. Well, that, it's hugely true today. Yeah. That we have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God. And, and that form of godliness actually deceives us into believing that we are Christians, that we are saved, that we are okay. And so we're patting ourselves on the back of all of our accomplishments when we're actually doing the work of Satan. Agreed. But instead of following the divine plan, instead of taking advantage of the heavenly vision, men have sought out <clears throat> many inventions in harmony with Satan's devices, for he is the instigator of these vain imaginations. If men would cease to trust in man, cease to put confidence in their own devices, and in simplicity of faith, trust in the Lord God of Israel, they would come out of the cave of the darkness of human reasoning and stand in Jesus Christ, where they could hear the voice of God and know the voice of the true shepherd. Who was it that was called out of the cave? Elijah? Yes. Are we not to stand as Elijah at this time in earth's history? Yes. Now, one of the things that happens when we trust in God... So when man has his devices on how he works, he thinks that he's being successful. Correct. Um, and when people try God's methods, it appears we're not successful. Right? That is, when we're trusting in God in his way of working, um, what, what we find is that it's it's working his working is invisible to the eye of man yes but it's not invisible to the eye of faith so the simplest thing that we can do is to represent christ in our character and and people think well you know how am i going to convert people how am i going to be leading people to christ i mean it's a thing that we all struggle with you know, even in this movement, this movement is a is a movement based on a very simple idea. There's not a bunch of fancy stuff attached to it. Right. Right. It, it's basically simple preaching, praying, doing a presentation, praying to close. There isn't, you know, big fancy videos with lots of music and and all kinds of introductions and um, and. You know, and lots of videos, you know, we don't have like a table of all these videos and everybody's buying all the videos and all the, you, you understand what I'm saying? I do. It, it's simple, but it appears from human sight to be a failure. 
But, but of course, if we understand what faith is, just in the simple idea of salvation, you know, Christ, it appeared to Christ that he was, you know, he was constantly confronted with apparent failure. You know, the Christian, he that's seeking to perfect Christian character will never indulge the thought that he's sinless. He could be a living representative of the truth that he professes. But the closer he comes to Christ, the more clearly he discerns his own defects, the more sinful he appears in his own eyes. Right. And and so this idea of faith, trusting in God's system, the problem why people don't like it is it takes faith. Exactly. People don't have faith, right? So they want something they can see. So if we can have a big evangelistic series, and um, even if we have to pay people to come to that evangelistic series, and even if they're not, don't, not even really converted, but we baptize 5,000 people who just end up going back to their to the world, we think that was a success. But just one soul who is reached and who comes to God in confession and repentance, and, and that we never know about, is of greater value than those 5,000 that are baptized and never converted. Right. Now, we are not to have faith in the devices of man. We are to trust simply by faith that the Lord is capable of doing exactly what he says he can do. There are many that would say that we are being foolish. Now, Quite honestly, I would rather be counted foolish in following the word of God than be counted as the wisest of men in walking contrary to him. Zechariah 3.3. 3. Now Joshua was, was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Now, it's interesting to me, but was Zechariah, as he is in vision here, was he being shown a real person? So you're saying, was Joshua the high priest a real person? Yeah. Well, yeah. So Zechariah had knowledge of Joshua at that time. Mm -hmm. So Zechariah was having a vision where there was something personal for him to understand. So the finger was not being pointed directly at Joshua. It was also being pointed right back at Zechariah. So if Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Zechariah is being shown his condition as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we always, at least we always should do that when we look at the scriptures and see that it's applying to us. I mean, I've always done that with this story of Joshua, the high priest. I understand that it represents the work that God wants to do in my life. Right. right. That we have our filthy garments removed and we get clothed with the change of raiment. So Joshua, the high priest, becomes typical of the people of God. Right. And and as you know, we talked about before, um, Joshua does represent Christ here, too. And if you think about what Jones studied last night, where Christ has become us, mm -hmm. is us, we can see that that's the case here as well. So 
So Joshua is representing Christ as much as he's representing God's people. Though there is Christ is there too as the one affecting this change of character. But we know the high priest represents the people and Christ came and represented us. So this is representing, in a sense, the work of Christ in us. Correct. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel, as we find in Zechariah 3, 1 to 3. Here we find a representation of the people of God today. There is no more direct statement that can be made than we are standing before God in filthy garments. As Joshua stood before the angel clothed with filthy garments, so we stand in the presence of Christ, clothed in garments of unrighteousness. Christ, the angel before whom Joshua stood, is now interceding for us before his father, as he is here represented as interceding for Joshua and his people, who were in deep affliction. And Satan now, as then, stands by to resist his efforts. Now, with Joshua being someone that Zechariah would have recognized, that Zechariah would have known, are we then to understand the time in which this Joshua was recognized? What, what is that question? I don't understand it. Okay. What time was Zechariah writing? Well, he's, he's writing during the time of the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple. Right. He's writing at a time where the temple is to be rebuilt and the people are to come to understand what the law of God requires of them. So as, as a symbol, we're going to have the, the second decree, which is going to be the second angel's message. Right. Which but is, would, in a sense is the time we're in. Uh, because the second angel's message repeats to join the third. Are we not being called also to be prepared to give the message of that third decree. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the second angel's message. Now, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. Who is speaking? Who is speaking to those that stood before him? Christ. Exactly. And Christ answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from Joshua. Take away the filthy garments from my people. <clears throat> and unto him he said, Unto Joshua, Christ has said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. How important is it for us to see 
a change of raiment. What is this change of raiment as far as we would come to understand? Well, it's a change of character. Exactly. Now, I find it interesting because there was a Joshua the high priest. Joshua the high priest, the son of Josedek. And I believe we can find him referenced in the book of Habakkuk. So if we were looking at this time at Habakkuk, I believe we would find that this is giving a an example for us at this time. So, where's that in Habakkuk? Just a moment. If we are looking, excuse me, not Habakkuk, Haggai. Okay. My mistake. That makes more sense. My mistake. Yeah. Someone's got a time difference? Because Haggai is taking place in the second year of Darius the king. Yeah, so it's going to be Haggai 2 4. Well, if we looked at Haggai 1 1. Well, yeah, one, one. Um, well, starting there and then going to verse four. Right. Um, or, or, or pardon me. Yeah. So two, yeah. And it's going to say, yeah, it's going to mention Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest in one, one. Yeah. So the second year of Darius, the king in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So he's the, the high priest at that time. Right. Now, of course, um, they haven't rebuilt the temple. It's not finished. So he's not operating in that temple at that time. So right. when they have these visions, the temple isn't completed. Um, but they want to complete it. So they're going to re uh, recommence the construction that had begun 20 years earlier. Well, 19 years earlier. <clears throat> now, as I, as I was looking at this and as I was reading through the, the work that Brother Stephen had done on tabled history, all of this gives a, a very direct step by step breakdown of where and how this temple was to have been rebuilt. I believe the time spans between the visions were something like 20 years, 59 years, and then 13 years as to how the, the temple's itself and Jerusalem were to be completed. Now, as Mrs. White continues, from manuscript 16 of 1884, which was a non-published manuscript at that time, appearances will deceive. The masterly miracle working power of Satan has carried the whole world with them and the fallen churches and those only who have made the Bible their study, who have the law of God engraven in their hearts 
will stand the test of this time of satanic delusion and peril. If it were possible, Jesus tells us, they would deceive the very elect. Satan impersonating Jesus Christ is worshipped as God. Shout upon shout of victory is heard in adoration and in praise. Angels of God are waiting the mandate from the divine advocate, which shall place man above the wrath of Satan. Think of this for a moment. These angels, these messengers of God, are waiting for the word from Christ that are going to place those that believe in him above the wrath of Satan. The Lord of heaven in a verse sorrows and rejoices over his repenting, believing children. The steadfast adherence to principle was attended by loss, by sacrifice, and by peril. Their adherence to the commandments of God provoked calumny and the hatred of the disloyal and apostate churches. Whatsoever is not sustained by the Bible standard must not be entertained. Those who are the agents of Satan are vindictive, cruel, and like their master. Those who make the Bible their standard must expect abuse, outrage. In the cause of truth, there can be no compromise. <clears throat> How many times? As we look to the Bible as our rule of faith, do we make changes within our lives? And how many times do we have others when these changes are made that make fun of us or choose to want to know why we are being so peculiar? Jesus is looking from his throne upon his people. His interest is identified with his suffering brethren. With joy, the angel hears the word from Jesus. Take away the filthy garments from him and clothe him with a change of raiment. And he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Zechariah 3, 4. Praise God for this. Satan sees that he is about to lose his last chance of subverting these souls, and he brings all the powers of his satanic generalship into intense activity. The last great act in the drama is impersonating Jesus Christ. His disguise is discerned by none but those who are established in the scriptures and acquainted with the word of God. How can we become acquainted with the word of God if we're never studying it? How can we become acquainted with the word of God if we are relying upon man to tell us what it says? The saints look on with amazement. Will they also be deceived? Will they worship Satan? Angels of God are about them. A clear, firm, musical voice is heard. Look up. There was one object before the praying ones, the final and eternal salvation of their souls. This object was before them constantly. That immortal life was promised to them who endure until the end. Oh, how earnest and fervent had been their desires. The judgment and eternity were in view. Their eyes by faith were fixed on the blazing throne before which the white-robed ones were to stand. 
This restrained them from the indulgence of sin. They were ripening for heaven. Consider that point. <clears throat> the white robed ones were restraining them from the indulgence of sin. These were being ripened for heaven. They had been cultivating spiritual mindedness and striving soul, might, mind, and strength with persevering energy to copy the pattern that they might be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing and to meet their Lord in peace. Their souls went out in all the intense longing for to see Jesus and by beholding by faith the character and purity of Jesus, they were being transformed into his image. They were being brought into close harmony with Jesus Christ, and they had indomitable purpose. They would not dishonor God. They would not receive the mark of the beast or of his image. They would overcome as servants and sons of God that they might inherit all things. Is this work of ripening going on today? Is it going on within our characters currently? And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Now here, Mrs. White repeats Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. Satan is ever ready to offer resistance to the work that Christ is willing to do for the souls of men. Jesus asks, is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Zechariah 3, 2. Have I not chosen this people for myself? Although they have transgressed, the command is given, take away the filthy garments. Can a change of raiment occur if the person wants to hold on to the filthy and stained garments? God will never place his garment of righteousness upon those who retain their filthy garments. Exactly. Though I've heard a pastor when I was first an Adventist um, think of it. I can't think of the guy's name. But he's a black pastor from the States. And, and he said that Jesus puts his garment of righteousness over our filthy garments. Yeah, I think it was C.D. Brooks, but um, okay. um, but it could be wrong. It could have been someone else. Um, but that's obviously directly contrary to what Ellen White says. But everybody said amen. Yeah. Many times, as I have worked over the years, I've had my garments, my clothing, become filthy, become stained, become very smelly. Now, when I wanted to change my garments, when I wanted to, to have something clean, I have never put clean clothes over and on top of filthy clothes. Have any of you? No. Nope. 
Christ is able <clears throat> to take away the filthy garments. Are we not to cooperate with him when he seeks to take these filthy garments away? From the chat, the answer is given. Yes, we are. This will be said concerning every soul that truly repents of sin and believes in Christ. The righteousness of Christ will be imparted unto him. Christ came to bring divine power to man to clothe him in righteousness, in his righteousness. He says, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Isaiah 49, 16. He knows us by name. He knows all of our trials and all of our sorrows. He has wept and prayed. He knows how to succor everyone who mourns. Satan will tell you that you cannot hope in God's mercy, that you are too great a sinner to be saved. But you should tell him that Jesus has said, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. This is again a great promise for us. When Christ bowed on the banks of the Jordan, he offered up a prayer in behalf of humanity. And heaven was opened unto him, and the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove of burnished gold and encircled his form. And a voice came from heaven which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew three seventeen. What does this mean? It meant that heaven was open to the petitions of humanity. When Jesus died on Calvary, the Father accepted the sacrifice and humanity was exalted in the scale of moral worth with God because Christ had become a partaker of humanity and had undertaken its redemption. The proclamation of Christ on the cross, it is finished, tells you that you are prisoners of hope. If we're a prisoner of hope, are we to despair? Are we to, to believe that things are so dark and so foreboding? Or are we to praise God? There are many who idolize feeling. Does God call us to feel that we are saved? Or does God call us to know that his salvation is sure? Your hope is not founded upon feeling. It is founded on the word of God. Where in the Bible are we to base our faith on feeling? I don't find it anywhere. Has God not given you abundant evidences of his love? I point you to Calvary. The light of the cross should dispel every doubt from your mind. God loves you and he wants to save you. You should cling to the mighty one and lay hold on the merit of a crucified and risen savior. He is your perfection. He has brought you his righteousness at an infinite cost. Will you accept it? This is our choice. Are we willing to accept the righteousness of Christ? 
are we willing to become righteous by faith? Yes. In all of these studies, as we have gone through the book of Judges, as Theodore has been presenting for us the studies on righteousness by faith on Friday nights, we are being presented with a choice. We are being shown examples from these charts. We are being shown examples of the foundation of the, of the faith of the pioneers. We are being shown the path on which we are to be walking in order that this final message might be given first to the church, then to the people, and then to the world. Who are we to be unified with? Are we to be unified with these great theologians, these men that believe they know more than God? And I'm speaking directly upon the doctors of divinity, because how can you become a doctor? One that is above God. How can you become a doctor of that which is divine? To me, that's incomprehensible. We should talk faith and educate the soul to praise God. In what are we to praise God? In all things. In all things. If something goes south, something isn't right as we see it, are we to praise God? Mm -hmm. Are we to praise God when things unexpectedly fall in our favor? Mm -hmm. Are we to praise God, as it says in Scripture, in all things, good, bad, indifferent, no matter what, are we to be praising God? Mm -hmm. And because we don't know necessarily God's providences and why things happen the way they do. Right. Says the Apostle. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. While you appreciate the love of God, you will have living faith. You must climb up by Christ. He is the ladder. We could not scale the battlements of heaven were it not for the fact that Christ is the ladder. The base of the ladder rests upon the earth, and the top reaches into the highest heavens. The base of this divine ladder touches the earth. If it had stopped one inch short of that, humanity could never have reached the first rung. But it is the goodness of God that leadeth you to repentance. And the grace and the mercy of God shines down on every round, for God is above the ladder. Its topmost round reaches into the heavens of heavens. The light of God's love brightens the whole length of the ladder, and every step upward is a step toward him. When we are mounting this ladder, we are on our way to the mansions which Christ has gone to prepare for those that love him. Says the apostle, I have not seen nor ear heard, 
neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This next document was written on the 18th of May of 1893, which was the first day of the second month of the biblical year 5938, and was entitled The Successful Teacher. There is no picture presented before our imagination of a sorrowful shepherd returning without the sheep. Amazing picture that those words present. And the Lord Jesus declares the pleasure of the shepherd and his joy in finding the sheep causes pleasure and rejoicing in heaven among the angels. And when the children and the youth stray from the fold, do not give them up. Do not expel them from the school. Do not show that you want to humiliate them. But with tender voice and yearning love, seek them, knowing that all heaven is enlisted with you in the work to bring them back to the fold. The Lord has presented these lessons for you who are educators. He has a living interest for each separate child of his redeemed so that he has not left them to be exposed and perished in the wilderness of temptation because you drove them there for Satan to work his cruel will upon them. How many of you have ever spent time around sheep? I, I had sheep. It was interesting for me several years ago to spend a week at a sheep ranch over in Montana. It was surprising for me to see that sheep tend to follow the leader. If one decides they're going to go off someplace, the whole herd, an uh, entire flock will follow the one. And it's interesting to watch them because they get into a situation that they have no idea how they're going to return. And then they'll just stand there bleeding. And you can hear them. And they are waiting for one to lead them back to safety. The wisdom of God, his power, and his love are without a parallel. It is the divine guarantee that not one of even the straying sheep and lambs is overlooked, and not one is left unsuckered, suckered, uncomforted. A golden chain. <clears throat> The mercy and compassion of divine power is passed around every one of these imperiled souls. Then shall not the human agent cooperate with God? Shall he be sinful, failing, defective in character himself, regardless of the soul ready to perish? Christ has linked him to his eternal throne by offering his own life. Where else have we addressed and have we discussed the golden chain? The golden chain? Yes, the golden chain. I know we talked about the prophetic chain, the golden chain of prophecy that connects um, the past to the present. Right. So where have we discussed this golden chain of prophecy? I don't remember. Did not Father Miller see a golden chain beginning at 677 
and coming all the way down. Mm -hmm. So here's Mrs. White in 1893, alluding to this golden chain. She is alluding to this golden chain 50 years after 1843. So this golden chain is linked directly with Christ. This golden chain of prophetic time is based on God's mercy and compassion of his divine power. And is passed around every one of these imperiled souls. So God is putting this chain around those of us that choose to believe his word. And that he is able to do exactly as his word says he is able to do. Zechariah's description of Joshua, the high priest, is a striking representation of the sinner for whom Christ is mediating, that he shall be brought to repentance. Satan is standing at the right hand of the advocate, resisting the work of Christ and pleading against him that man is his property through choosing him as his ruler but the defender of man the restorer the mightier than the mightiest hears the demands and the claims of satan and answers him the lord rebuke thee o satan even that lord hath chosen jerusalem rebuke thee is not this a brand plucked out of the fire Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head, so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Bear in mind that every teacher that takes the responsibility of dealing with human minds, that every soul who is inclined to err and is easily tempted is the special object for whom Christ is solicitor. They that are whole need not a physician, but those who are sick. The compassionate intercessor is pleading. And will sinful, finite men and women repulse a single soul? Shall any man or woman be indifferent to the very souls for whom Christ is pleading in the courts of heaven? Are we to pass by those that are ill, that are injured, that are lying alongside the road? Shall you in your course of action imitate the Pharisees who would be merciless and Satan who would accuse and destroy? Or will you individually humble your own souls before God and let that stern nerve and iron will be subdued and broken? Are we <clears throat> to ignore the suffering around us?
step away from the sound of Satan's voice and acting his will, and stand by the side of Jesus possessing his attributes, the possessor of keen and tender sensibilities, who can make the cause of the afflicted suffering ones his own. The man who has had much forgiven will love much. Jesus is a compassionate intercessor, a merciful and high faith, a merciful and faithful high priest. He, the majesty of heaven, the king of glory, can look upon finite man, subject to the temptations of Satan, knowing that he has mm -hmm. felt the power of Satan's wiles. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, clothing his divinity with humanity, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Satan claims a right to have those who once stood under his black banner, but who have turned from sin to the living God and have cast their helpless souls upon Jesus. Every soul who takes hold of the merits of Christ by faith has the pledged word of God that they shall make peace with him. He says, let him take hold of my strength and make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, 5. Trials are permitted to come upon the chosen people of God. Are we not to be tested, tried, and made white? What does this say to us at, from the book of Revelation? If we're not tested, are we not, I mean, tests are just proving where our soul is, where our character is. Are we not to praise God in every test and trial that comes before us? The expression is used, God tempted Abraham. God tempted the children of Israel. Genesis 22.1, Judges 2.22. This means that the Lord permitted Satan to tempt them in order that their faith might be found unto honor and glory when the judgment shall sit and when every man shall be judged according to the deeds done in the body. God knows every heart. He knows every motive. He knows every thought in the heart of man. But he, prevent, he permits Satan to try to tempt and test his believing ones in order that their trust and confidence in God might be revealed. In the trial, if true to God, they reveal the fact that they render obedience to his written word. Are we to obey the word of man or are we to render obedience to the word of God? Consider this carefully as we go forward. All these trials and close personal tests are to result in magnifying the name of the Lord, who is waiting to bestow strength and grace upon those who call upon him. This is the way in which the trial proceeds from God and works for the good of those who love God 
for the abundant grace of God is revealed before the heavenly universe, before worlds unfallen, and before the eyes of men. I've had it said, why are we praising God when things go wrong? Here again, we are to magnify the name of the Lord. We are to show that our great faith is in what he is doing in our lives. Elijah, as he stood on Mount Carmel, had praised the Lord. And these trials, where he stands alone against the priests of Baal and the priests of the grove, were to show that God is God, that he is capable of doing exactly what he says he will do. But when Elijah was presented with a one-on-one -on -one test from a servant from Jezebel, what happened to Elijah? What did Elijah do? He fled in fear because he had taken his eyes off God at that point. He was just really, really tired. and yeah, He needed a refilling of, of, of God's spirit. Exactly. What did he flee from? Well, there was a threat upon his life. So he, he, he fled, fled from the wicked queen. So he fled from the word of the woman and trusted not in the word of God because he was tired, because he had been asleep. Now, All of us at this time are called to waken from our slumber. Are we not? We will be giving a message much like Elijah. We will be giving a message that others are going to hate. The Lord hates sin, but he loves and forgives the repentant, believing sinner and takes him under his guardianship and control. Satan is on the track of every soul, but with every temptation that is permitted to come upon the children of God's pardoning love, he makes a way of escape in order that they shall not be tempted above that which they are able to bear. Divine strength is imparted to make the believing child able to resist the temptation and to escape the snare. Is this not a great promise for us today? Is this not something that we can hold on to? That as long as we are repenting of our sins, that we are believing that God's word can do exactly as he says it will do, and as long as we are allowing God to take us under his guardianship and control, while Satan is on our track, we don't have to worry. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. 
and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The work of Satan is plainly defined as that of resisting the meritorious work of Christ. He resists him in his efforts to come to the help of the tempted and tried soul that calls upon him. When Christ steps in between the tempted souls and Satan, the adversary is angry and opens up with a tirade of abuse and accusation, declaring that Christ is unfair in protecting these souls and lifting up a standard against him. But the Lord says unto him, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Here again, she writes of how Joshua is clothed with filthy garments and standing before Christ. Joshua is representing the people of God. Joshua has been betrayed into transgression by listening to his deceptive reasoning. Joshua has listened to the deceptive reasoning of the adversary. Is this not a true picture of what's been going on within this movement today? God has promised if the sinner repents to have mercy upon him and to pardon his transgression. Oh, what reason we have to love Jesus, to have our hearts full of grateful thank offerings, because he takes every soul who will be led and instructed and leads him through every obstructed way, defeating the arch adversary at every step. Jesus has res rescued precious souls, paying the ransom of his life for the whole world. Herein is love. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32. Ample provision have been made whereby we not need fall under the temptations and there is no excuse for us to sin. Joshua is charged with being a transgressor of the law, and Satan is at hand to present his sin in the most aggravated light although he himself has, through his subtlety, led him to commit the sin. Satan claims Joshua is his subject. He represents him as the one who is undeserving of the care and mercy and the love of God. This will be Satan's plea that his determined purpose in the last great conflict, God accepts the faith that acknowledges Christ as the sinner's personal savior. And he looks with tender love and pity upon his believing ones. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it is only to those that choose to believe, that choose to accept and live by the word of God that can be covered in the righteousness of Christ. In the presence of the world's unfallen, in the presence of the universe of heaven, in the presence of the angry adversary who has painted them in robes of blackness and moral defilement, urging that they may be given into his hands, Jesus has answered Satan's malignant charge, whereby he accused them before God day and night. 
to those who stood before him earnestly watching the controversy and marking the determination of Satan to destroy the righteous, Jesus spoke, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I have said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, Christ's righteousness, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Now what is this mitre that is set upon the head of Joshua? How do we see this? How should we break this one down? Well, I mean, it would be a, a crown of righteousness showing that he's victorious. Okay. Where else do we find crowns being set upon the head of the righteous? Well, Ellen White mentions it, and I'm, I'm not sure which. Do we not find this for those that are upon the sea of glass? Yeah, the 144,000. Do we not find this, that the redeemed all have crowns? Mm -hmm. And they're the crowns of their victory. It's... Exactly. So here is Christ. He is giving to Joshua the clean raiment. He is providing a crown upon his head. Now I present this matter before you and before all the people of God who shall read these lines. The work of Christ is to heal, not to destroy. The work of God is not to tear down, but to build up. Let none educate themselves in accusing Christ's living workmen or his precious sleeping saints, whom he has sealed unto himself. Be careful on those whose side that you are choosing to work. When we are backbiting, when we are gossiping, are we healing or are we destroying? Uh, backbiting is destroying. Over the last many months, we have watched what has been happening. It is sad for us that many brothers and sisters that should be joining in these studies are choosing not to, to do so. It's sad to see so many accusations, so much gossip, so much rumor, so much innuendo. These are not things that Christ uses. This is the work of our adversary. When she states, be careful on whose side you are working, is she not presenting an admonition to us today? Mm -hmm. So this has obviously been a difficult part of what's been happening with this movement because you know on the one hand we can we can see that there is a separation we have no control over what someone else does um but we do have control over what we do right and so it's easy especially when there's a separation to allow the imaginings of what other people think and feel and to sort of become bitter about that um, instead of focusing upon what, what it is we can do. And sometimes we, well, let's say all the times, we feel 
completely inadequate for the situation. We don't know what to do. But if we look at what this lesson has been talking about, trusting in Christ, uh, using Christ's methods, not seeing, um, not looking for the results so that we can know that, that we're doing the right thing, but doing it based upon the principles of the gospel and trusting in faith that God is working out his will, um, we will be able to see the power of God. Right. But we see it, you know, through faith, understanding God's purposes. And it's just that it's discouraging when we don't see it, and especially when we see the things that we have done wrong, wonder whether we're to blame for the situation to some degree, right? So right. we have a part to blame. So at least I look at it that, that way personally. I look at the things that I that I did wrong, but yet I can't correct those either. I can't correct the mistakes of the past, and I can't correct what I the, the errors and mistakes I believe I perceive in others. I can't make choices for them, but I can now you know, confess my sins when I see them and trust in God and now act uh, in accordance with God's will. Okay, any other thoughts on this? Well, you know, I mean, we're, we're planning to go to Colin's study tonight. Okay. And, um, you know, it's it's a difficult situation because, you know, they have a belief that, you know, we're just trying to get them to go to our camp meeting, so they boycotted it. Um, but, you know, the reality is we just care for them, right? We care for the people in this movement. We want to see people coming together. And, I mean, obviously we're going to make an appeal uh, uh, for people to be there at the camp meeting is they have an opportunity to meet together with people of like mind and and to hear messages related to this movement. It seems to me remarkable uh, that somebody would not go to that, even if they didn't agree with everything being said, which we never do anywhere. Um, and so, you know, we have to trust that in putting together this camp meeting, that God's purposes will be fulfilled. Sometimes those purposes are not our purposes. And that's a hard thing to take at times. Because right. what we want to see happen to individuals that we love and care for may not happen because people are going to make choices that are different than what God wants. And we, we believe that what we want for them is what God wants, right? It's like the same with my children. You know, they make choices. I, I know what I believe God wants for them to do, and they're going to make different choices. That's a hard thing to watch. So to see somebody that you love and care for making a choice that that appears to be contrary to God's will, that, that's a difficult thing to trust that God is going to take care of that person and that situation. You know, you, you fear for them and you fear for yourselves. in all of these things we are reaching out to others there are those that are believing that the study of chronology the application of dates, the symbolic use of numbers is going too far afield. Yet in everything that we are doing, in everything that we have been studying, we are finding 
more reasons to trust in the way in which God is leading. Now, a comment from the chat <clears throat> in Judges 7, the 300 who drew up water to drink in their palms were accepted. The majority who carelessly drank with their tongues in the water would, were dismissed. These can represent those who've engrossed with sticking their tongues into other people's business with suspicion, rumors, innuendos. They were and are devoted to this bowing upon their knees. May it be said that we are willing to set aside our preconceived notions and to follow where Christ would have us to be. Tonight, we should be praying for you as you go to call and study, that their hearts may be willing to be open and receptive to the plea that will be made. Is there any other thought, question, or comment regarding what we have covered today? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, thank you for your willingness to take away our garments of shame. Thank you for your willingness and your ability to clothe us in the robes of Christ's righteousness. Help my unbelief. Guide us each one so that we may walk closer with you. So that we may be more like Enoch. So that we walk so closely with you that we do not discern the world around us and that we continue to walk with you into the world that is to come. Thank you, Father, for these opportunities. Thank you for your blessing. Guide us today so that your character may be fully represented to all of those with whom we come in contact. Give us strength, wisdom, and help us to rely directly upon that which you would have us to know at this time. Thank you, Father, for these blessings, for this time together, for the comments and the participation. Help us now to put this into practice, and to walk with you. For this we ask, for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.